opportunity Amen. to serve <laughs> on this morning. We honor First Lady, amen, the officers and members of this church, those of our membership that are absent, amen, uh, and to our guests, amen, amen. Uh, and those visiting with us from social media, God bless you, we thank you for allowing us to serve you yet one more opportunity. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you will turn with me, amen, familiar passage to Matthew 19, we will read in your hearing verses 16 through 22. find these words. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou would enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou would be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Amen. If I may reason with you just for a little while on this morning, I'd like to do so from the thought. God's wisdom can't be built upon the foundation of your knowledge. Amen. When we look at this text, I've preached from it several times. We talk about it all the time. And this, it, it just speaks to the sense that there's so much that can be taken out of Scripture um, for Revelation's sake. And when we look at this thought process, we see the young man coming to Jesus, as usual, asking how he can enter into eternal life. And I like to think that this is where we sit when we come to God. We come to a place where we deal with our mortality, and we understand that there is something more, and we get to the point where we want to work on that. And he comes and he asks about this, and God tells him something that is twofold. He says, one, go out and sell all that you have. And secondly, he says, give them to the poor. And we all know that this is a very selective group of people that represents the widow, the orphan, and the, the crippled and maimed that cannot work and have inheritance. And so God says, deal with this, you'll have treasures in heaven, and then come and follow me. And so at the end of this, uh, before even at the end of this, he says, if you keep the commandments, you'll be all right. But then that's an additional step. So what I want to point out to you is that Many times, as this young man is in the place of, we feel that moral goodness should get us into heaven. We feel that if we do the basic things, that 
that's all should be necessary. Sometimes we don't want to go the extra spiritual mile to do the spiritual commandment. We'll do the things that are satisfactory to us and allows us to be in our own comfort zone. But when it comes to a place of getting out of that comfort zone and going the extra step where God would actually have us, we go away and say, that's not a commitment I can meet. In other words, he says that he went away because his possessions were great. And this is where we pick up where we are. And for the lack of a better understanding, we don't believe this about ourselves, but it is absolutely true. When we come to God, we want God to start endowing us with his wisdom based upon what we learn our entire life. And this is one thing that present, prevents us from, one, becoming a new creature. Two, it prevents us from doing the actual uh, uh, things that God would require from us. Because three, in the third point, our mind has never been to please God. Our mind has always sought to please ourselves. Our mind has always thought to put us first. But to put the commandments of God before ourselves seems to be a little bit more than what we truly want to do. But yet, we contend with the thought of wanting to leave here and move into eternal, eternal life. But somehow we don't want to do what's necessary. We want to do still what we want to do and just hope that we can slide in safe on that end. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God has an expectation of us. In fact, in Matthew 18 and 3, he says, if we are converted, number one, if we're converted and become as little children, unless we do those two things, we can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because we have to have a new childlike mindset once we come to God, which allows us to have a new birth, to have a new growth, to have a different mindset altogether. But many times we forsake God or we walk away sorrowful because we don't want to give up our one biggest possession. We want to still think like we want to think. We still want to do what we want to do and yet call ourselves saved. We want to do the bare minimum and hope that we can still possess eternal life. We want to feel that long as we do some good things, that that would be enough. But I'm here to tell you this morning, this thought process is not going to get us into heaven. This thought process is not the way that God works. This process will not do anything but cause us to lift our eyes in hell. Because unless we get above our own goodness that we see in ourselves, unless we understand that there's more required of us, the word says to whom much is given, much is required. Unless you're willing to say, God, I'll let go of this possession in this jewel of, uh, of mindset that I have, until I get to the point where I say that my way is not the right way. The reason I'm here is because everything that I've done for myself has landed me in a brick wall. Everything I have thought that was so clever has destroyed me. And because I now understand this, I need a little bit more wisdom. I need some guidance, but I'm here to tell you, God cannot guide you while you're yet trying to guide yourself. If you think for one second that God is going to turn around and let you think the way you want to and add his wisdom to that, you're sadly mistaken. We have to get to a point to where we can lose this possession that we have. We've got to give away this knowledge. We've got to give away what we think we know. I, I, I had this thought this morning. Nobody enters 
or should enter a higher educational learning thinking that they can come and tell the professor what they think they already know. You don't go to a higher learning educational state talking about what you know. You are there because you understand that you don't know. You're there because you understand that you need to learn something more than what you already think you know. And But this is the way we approach God. We say, I know what it is to live right. I've been doing all these things for I ain't never killed nobody. I don't steal nothing from nobody. I treat my neighbor like myself. But do you? Do you truly think of people the way you think of yourself? Would you do some of the things to yourself that you allow yourself to do to others? Do you feel that the way you treat others is truly the way you want to be treated? And when you don't become cognizant of that, it means that you're still thinking and relying on your natural nature. You're still doing things according to earthly wisdom and knowledge which is far under the knowledge of God. But if we would step up to divine knowledge, if we want to step up to divine wisdom, we've got to get rid of the thing that's holding us back, thinking that we're good enough, thinking that all you've got to add to is the goodness that I already have, and I'll be all right. But that calls for a total change. The word doesn't say that you become somewhat new. It doesn't say that you get to hold on to what the word says that if you try to put new wine into old skins, it busts wide open. And this is what's happening to the word that we think that we're putting into us. We're busting wide open and it's running right out of us. Because for us to be new and hold new wisdom, we've got to let go of the one thing that refutes it. Oh, glory to God. If you truly think about this, when you hear the truth of God's word, your common earthly knowledge always refutes it. Oh, no, it can't be that. Think about Nicodemus. Jesus tells him, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. That's foolish. God, what, 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 are, you, what are you thinking? How can I be born in my mother's womb a second time? Earthly knowledge will always refute spiritual understanding. If you continue to think in your earthly mind, you can never please God. The word has instructed you. The carnal mind cannot be subject to the law of God. You can't become subject still thinking in the carnal mind. You can't still hold on to what you think you know and try to do what God is asking because you will never understand what God is asking until you let go of what you think. But long as we want God to just layer over us, check this out, our knowledge, and then let us extend into his wisdom, it's like building a house on a foundation of sand. It sinks, and eventually it slides off of its foundation. This is a promise of the word of God. So if you truly want to move into eternal life, if when you lay this life down, you want to actually go into glory, you've got to get rid of the one thing that will cause you to miss it, which is this stinking thinking that you have. God doesn't care about our moral goodness. He doesn't care that you obeyed your parents, that you never murdered nobody, that you never did this and never did this. All the things that you, see, because these things, watch this. All these things do is allow you to compare yourself to somebody else and make you feel that your sin is less than their sin because you haven't done what they have done. When God himself said sin is simply that, sin. I've got a place for all of it. Not just some of it, but all of it. And if you want to enter my kingdom, your focus has to be on me and not how you feel you measure up to the person beside you. Because in that day, the only person that's going to be standing before that throne is you. 
The only person that's going to be judged is you. Not the person that you compared yourself to, to, to uh, uh, all your life saying, well, they're worse off than me. I, I've got to be better. Because God says you're not. God says, I want you. I don't want your thoughts of everybody else. I don't want your convictions. I don't want your thoughts in the way. I, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. For the only reason for you to come into my way is to now adapt my thoughts. Get this. If he says, high are the heavens above the earth, or my ways and my thoughts above your thoughts, how can you feel that you can ascend with just the wisdom of your own? How can you ascend into the heavens with just what you think? The answer is you cannot. The answer is this is why he's told you in the beginning that his ways are so much higher. His standards are so much higher that you, in the way you think, can't even get up off the ground. All you can do is scamper across the ground, but you cannot soar with your knowledge. Your wisdom has, think about it, your wisdom has gotten you nowhere. Your wisdom has not turned out one good thing regardless of how good you think you are. So, we got to stop thinking that I came to God just as I am, and now I'm somebody. No, you're still nobody. Long as you feel that you can hold on to, watch this. The generational things that we have done our whole life, they need to be looked into. The ways that we thought were right, they got to be looked into. Everything that we feel has been okay up to this point has to be reconsidered. There is, in other words, nothing that we do in life that has been okay, that meets God's standard. And when we come to that conclusion, and when we're really ready to dump all this stuff that we think we know to learn something better, we can truly do not, we can truly not do any better. This is why we're not moving into the promises of God. This is why we're not embracing the promises of God. This is why it still seems to elude us. <clears throat> as we're trying to hold on to it and we keep missing it. Because the way we think doesn't cause us to grasp it. You think God's promise should just be just because I did this, this, and this. I should be able to obtain that. Well, God says, I didn't give you the promise just as a quick pro pro. You're thinking that I do this, God gives me that. No. You start to do godly things and you start live to live in a godly way. This is, this is just simple obedience. It's the same thing that you offer to your children. When you tell them, I'll give you everything and anything that you want. Anything that's in my power to give you, I'll give you just if you just do what I ask you to do. When I ask you to do it. Not when you get ready to do it. Think about this. Oh, glory to God. I love you. Think about this. I'm getting ready to get out your way. But what if your child told you, you, you said to your child, get up and go wash the dishes. Right now. And your child responded. I'm going to, but I'm watching my favorite show right now. When it goes off, I get up and wash the dishes. Your mind would not move to the fact of satisfaction that they're going to wash the dishes when they got ready. Your mind is going to deal with the immediacy that you have given them a commandment to move right now. This is all you're going to think about. And that's going to vex and perplex you. How do you think that you can turn around my commandment and do it when you get ready? What if I come in there with a punishment before your show comes on. What if I pull the plug on the TV that I purchased? Amen. <laughs> what if I tell you this show is 
it's not going to exist in my house anymore. Then what? But this should show you everything that happens to us when God tells us to do something. We think we got all the time in the world to do it. And then God says, huh, you must have forgot who I am. I am the one who puts oxygen outside. I am the one who makes sure you get up every morning. This is me doing this. This ain't you. Your alarm clock don't wake you up every morning. Your job is not what makes sure your bills are paid. It is me. It is the favor on your life that I have placed there. <clears throat> and as a good parent, you would, you would turn around and ask, uh, make sure your child understands their way of thinking is not lining up. And as they think that it's harmless, and they say, well, I, I said I was going to do it. And then you respond to tell them, you don't tell me when you're going to follow what I tell you to do. If I say right now, that's exactly what I mean. But here's the wisdom of God. He says he has placed these things here so we have a greater understanding of him. But yet, because we're thinking in our own finite minds, because we think the way we think, we don't transcend the commandments of God to our own commandments. We're worried about how we feel about what we do, but we're not worried about what we do, what we do. Transmit, translates to God. There's been many times God has told us to get up and wash the dishes right now. And we said, well, I, I do it when my show goes off. And guess what happened? Before your show went, uh, went off, you fell asleep and woke up the next morning and never did the dishes. And then you, he tells you, take out the trash. Uh, I, 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 and he said, why you didn't take out your hand? Just like on Friday. He, why you didn't take out your hand? I fell asleep. And God said, I wish you would sleep right now. I'll knock you across the air on the left hook and make you get up and take out the trash. But God does not beat up on us. He lets us make our own decision. And then all of a sudden, the trash starts stinking. And then you take the trash out and can't get rid of the smell. And God says, I told you to take the trash out. When I told you to do it. But until we get into this place where we render our know-nothing knowledge, we can't layer the wisdom of God on top of that because his wisdom is far greater. Just in talking about a couple small things, it, it should make you see God greater. But if you think about them in the same manner of thinking without the spiritual aspect, you never see what God is intending. You never see what he's trying to push you towards. The kingdom of heaven is so much vast than what we see. It is so much greater than what we can expect. The word says, eyes have not seen, nor have ears heard, nor has it even entered into the mind of man <coughs> what he has for us. And yet, we measure up to his commandments by more goodness. How dare us? So I say as I close, get rid of your thinking. Be, be willing to really surrender the way you think, the way you were taught, the way you were trained. Get rid of all that stuff because I assure you the word is true. There's no other goodness on earth other than God. And if he tells you, your ways will not get you to heaven because he's the way. Your truth will not get you to heaven because he is the truth. Your life means nothing without his wisdom. Then don't be the unfortunate sorrowful one that walks away because you have great possessions. Be willing to get rid of it. Because what he is going to exchange it with is going to be far greater. I'm done.